Last week we started a series called A Seat at the Table. And as you look at our table this week, last week this very same table was full of a bunch of junk and leftover stuff and thing that, stuff that wasn't in its rightful place. And, and so we talked about that through and of course how really that's representative of the things that are out of order in our own life and how we need to get rid of the habitual sin and put things in order, make sure God is first in our life. And now we have a clean table, but I would ask uh, certainly at least the mothers of you in here, uh, is this table ready to eat off of? No. Why? Because there's nothing on it. Like, what are you going to do unless it's like finger food buffet style, which is not quite how we do it at our house because people are gross and your hands are nasty. So I would prefer utensils myself. And so what we need to do is say, well, this table is destined to be a place of a great feast, a place of a great meal, but it's not, it's not there yet. There's a, there's a process of preparation or preparing the table that it needs to go through. And you need to make sure you have all the right utensils. And make sure all the cups or the glasses with ice are all there. And you have your drinks and you have your condiments and you have your gravies and all that kind of stuff. And, and why do we do that? Well, because you don't want to have to get up 800 times because, Mommy, I don't have a fork. Mommy, my juices are like, like no, when you sit down, you need to be ready. And, and whenever I think of a family meal, and even though it's not the Christmas season yet, this is just the whole time of preparation. This is what popped in my head over and over, and so I felt like that was the Holy Spirit saying, you need to show this clip here. So this is a clip about what happens when things aren't prepared well. Y'all watch this. <sighs> Catherine, this turkey tastes half as good as it looks. I think we're all in for a very big treat. <laughs> Save the neck for me, Clark. <laughs> okay, Eddie. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Sorry. Why are you crying? Huh? I told you we put it in too early. Oh, it's just a little dry. It's fine. Let's hold to it. Here's the heart. Oh, here's the heart. Save the neck for me, Clark. Anyway, so what happens is, is uh, when things aren't prepared well, uh, they can actually look pretty good on the outside. But actually, when you get down into, uh, let's say, the metaphorical meat there, things aren't what they appear. And so the preparation step in anything is actually really important. And, and what we're talking about in this series, of course, isn't actually a table. I'm not trying to get you ready for your Thanksgiving. Like You can figure that out. What we're talking about is that this table is representative of, of, of our spiritual table is what we actually called it. And, and, and that, that we, we defined it in this way that the spiritual table is what you present to the world through your uh, actions, words, and responses. What well, you present to the world through your actions, words, and responses that each of us are surrounded by people, whether that's family, friends, coworkers, uh, acquaintances, people in our community, and we are offering something to them right? Like we are offering something at the table of our life. And, and last week we talked about how that is supposed to be something called the fruit of the Spirit. And how the fruit of the Spirit is the Spirit's working in us and then out of us. Because the fruit of the Spirit aren't actually for you. Like it's, it's just evidence that God is working in your life. And so our spiritual table is how we're representing ourselves. And so we ask the hard question, are we as Christian believers representing ourselves in such a way that a person from the outside would say, man, it is evident that the spirit of God is at work in them. Is, it is evident that Jesus Christ is first and foremost in their life. It is evident that they are a person that walks in faith and in trust in the Lord. And all of that is visible from our spiritual table as it's evident of what's on the table in your home. So last week was all about clearing out that habitual sin and those things that are out of place, making sure God's first. And today is about preparation. And so I came across this quote to kind of get us started. It's from John Maxwell. He's a Christian uh, author and thinker and leader. And he, he says it this way, that if you're proactive, then you're focused on preparing. But if you are reactive, then you will end up being focused on repairing. And a perfect example of that is that's why we change the oil in our car, right? Doesn't seem necessary. Doesn't seem like it's something you need to focus on, right? You don't need to worry about that. But over time, that lack of preparation and taking care of things and making sure they're in the right place will eventually lead to an expensive repair bill. 
or, you know, or, or not taking care of things in your, in your life. And so here's what you need to know as we go into this idea of preparation. There, there are kind of three main things here that flow from one another. I need you to know that number one, God has a plan for your life. Now listen, I'm not saying that because I'm a preacher. I'm not saying that because it's the Christian easy thing to do. I'm saying it because I genuinely believe that with all of my heart. I believe that if you are breathing, then God has a purpose for you, that God has a plan for you, and whether you walk in that or not is up to you, but God has a plan. And, and then that leads us to the second thing, is that God wants you to succeed in that plan. Because sometimes we can be convinced that God's plan is too hard. Now, obviously, God doesn't want me to succeed, and that's not true. God has a plan for you, whether you realize it or not, whether you're living in it or not, and he also wants you to succeed in that plan. He wants you to partner with him in that plan, which then leads us to the third one, and this is possibly the most important. Your best life will be lived in that plan. Like, like listen, what that means is, is that if you chase things of your own design, you may be happy for a moment, but you'll be miserable for a lifetime. But if you pursue God and you are living in his plan, even in difficulty, you will be happier than the person who's pursuing their own end and goals. And that just isn't my opinion. That has been worked out in countless believers. It has worked out in countless stories in Scripture. Your best life is in that plan because you are designed for it. God has a pattern for your life, and he wants you to live, and he wants you to be successful. But because God's a gentleman, he's not going to force you. He's not going to come in and make you. I kind of think this is what's so interesting about all of, listen, Judas followed Jesus for three years too, and yet Jesus didn't say, don't you dare. He says, go do what you will. Go and do what it is you have designed and conceived to do in your own mind. So that's a, that's a powerful lesson, just in and of itself, but I hope you know that God has a plan for you. So we're going to read a story out of Judges 6. We're going to read the story, and we're going to be introduced to a person in the story, and then we're going to talk about just how that has to do with our, our own preparation. So we're going to jump in, Judges 6, starting in verse 11. Then it says, The Lord came, and he sat under the oak tree that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Josiah the Abizrite, the son of Gideon. Uh, his son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. Then the angel of the Lord, Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, valiant warrior. Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened? <laughs> and where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us? They said, Hadn't the Lord brought us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in strength, you, the strength you have, and deliver Israel from the grasp of Midian. I am sending you. You. He said to him, please, Lord, how can I deliver Israel? Look, my family is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's family. But I will be with you, the Lord said to him. You will strike Midian down as if it were one man. Now, a little context here. You may have heard of Gideon before, uh, but in this time, we are after Moses and Joshua, after the first uh, five or six books of the New Testament were now in a book called Judges. And in the time of the Judges, it is uh, the recorded history of the time of Israel when there was no king, but it was post Moses and Joshua. They had been established for the most part in the land and the 12 tribes, and it had been divided up. Uh, but they still had a good bit of opposition in the land. And so what God would often do is he would rise up or he would bring up a leader. And there are several kind of famous judges that maybe you've heard about. Uh, one of them is Samson. Most of us have heard of Samson. Samson was a judge. Uh, the prophet Samuel was a judge. Uh, Deborah, a woman named Deborah at one point was a judge. There were several different judges, and Gideon is one of those judges who would rise up and become a specific leader. Uh, but here we're introduced to Gideon, and Gideon is doing something called threshing wheat. Now, what they would do in this day and age, and we understand what wheat is, where bread and cakes and all that kind of stuff come in, and uh, gluten, is, which is terrible if you're allergic to that stuff, but uh, what wheat is, is they would, they would put it down, and they're threshing wheat, they would put it down on the ground, and they would use these tools to thresh the wheat, and it would break apart the shaft from the seeds, the wheat grains, and then they would have these kind of bowl things, they would toss them up in the air, you might have even seen something like this before, and the purpose of tossing it in the air is the heavier seed grain would fall back down, but the looser shaft would be 
blown away in the wind. Well, if you would think about that strategically in an area where you had a long sight line, rolling hills as it was in this area, that if you were doing that, it would be seen for miles. And so Gideon, his family, and his tribe were under attack by a people called the Midianites. And they were stronger. They were better. The Midianites were. And so here we find Gideon, the youngest of his family, which is pretty key, uh, down in a wine cell, a wine press, which is a low-hanging spot, doing the work of threshing the weak, trying to stay hidden. Everybody was trying to stay out of sight. They didn't want them to know we're there. And so even their normal daily chores had to be found in a, or had to be done in a new way to stay hidden. And so we're introduced then to this character called the angel of the Lord. So whenever you hear the the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, there's a difference between the angel of the Lord and an angel or a messenger of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is traditionally from church history in the New Testament been considered the pre-incarnate Christ, the pre-incarnate Jesus. That's why we can say in John 1, in the beginning was The word, right? And so generally, anytime you hear God speak in the Old Testament, it is actually from the angel of the Lord, that the name of the Lord is in him. He is worshiped, like Joshua worships him. And even Gideon, later on in the story, responds to him as if he was God. And so we're actually seeing a pre-incarnate Jesus, just a fascinating fact to know about if you're confused to who the angel of the Lord is. So Gideon has a visitation from the Lord. And so they begin to have this story, and of course Gideon uh, is not in in a a place of preparation. He is not prepared for what's going to happen next. And so the story breaks down three things that we need to know about a preparation season. Because when God calls you to something, and he does, and he has a calling on your life, he has a purpose for your life, you don't just wake up one day and go, I got it. I'm where I need to be. No, there's always a season of preparation. So the first thing that this story shows us, is that we must let God speak to our future. You need to let God speak to your future. Judges 6, 12, then the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you, valiant warrior. Now, we don't really catch this, but when the Lord comes and tells Gideon, I am with you, the Lord is with you, valiant warrior, Gideon actually took that as an insult. He actually, he, he responds, the way he responds there is actually he, he was, he, most, most scholars believe everything that I read, he was insulted and offended and he fires back, oh really? Well, where is the Lord? That's what we read. Then he said, he said, well, please, if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened? We've said stuff like that before. Like, well, if the Lord is with me, why is my life like this, right? And where are all of his wonders that are ancestors? So I can see Gideon, he's threshing, he's sweaty. And then this random stranger, he doesn't know who it is yet, comes up and says, the Lord is with you, valiant warrior. Like, do you see somebody else? Are you crazy? Are you a crazy old blind man, Right? Are you, you know, you're looking at me. I say, like, don't you know who I am? I'm sitting here. I'm the youngest son. I'm the youngest son. I'm in here. The reason I'm doing this is because my older brothers are probably out there meeting with daddy in the kitchen. They're all standing guard out there fighting the Midianites. And they're like, hey, get in. Or thresh the wheat, son. We need you to go do something helpful and get out of the way. Stay out of the way. Just go find some, some, some low place. We need you to go hide, get in, because you're not, you're not ready. You're not ready for what is upon us. And so all of a sudden, the stranger comes and starts to say that, that you are a valiant fighter. And listen, whenever God comes to speak to you, he doesn't speak to you where you are. Because you know why? You know what it would sound like? Hello, broken individual. Hello, oh, terrified one, eaten up with anxiety and fear. Hello, old sinner. Hi, adulterer. Hi, thief. Hello, liar. See, God doesn't speak to our current status because God knows something about us that we often don't know. Is that it, but through him, he can turn broken things into powerful things. And so when the world loves to look at you and judge you for where you are, judge you for your, insign- you know, your insecurities, your, your insignificant things about your life, your mistakes, your past, God always comes into our life and he speaks over you. Matter of fact, I say it this way. God always speaks his purpose over you before you actually ever start doing it. And see, that's important to know because some of you are waiting around for God to tell you and confirm something in your life when God is speaking a whole other language. God is trying to get you to some place because he has a plan for you. 
And a lot of times he's going to come in and he may start speaking something to you that you can't even conceive. Gideon couldn't even understand. He thought it was an insult. How dare you come in and mock me? You know, you can have none of my wheat, mean person, you know. Who are you to come and say that? See, when I was a young person, this is just an illustration that I came up with, but this is a very true story and kind of maybe can help you understand how this maybe works in real time. We were going to a church, a little small church. I was maybe 9, 10, 11, can't exactly remember, but an evangelist had come to town, you know, one of those little old town revival things, and he'd asked at the end of the service, anybody wants to come up for prayer, and several people in the church came up for prayer, and my family came up for prayer, and me, and my siblings, and as the, as the evangelist's wife would kind of walk down and, and, and pray over people, they, they stopped over me. And, and, and they both kind of confirmed that, son, we don't know what it is, but we really just feel like we need to tell you, the Lord is telling you that, that he has a specific purpose for you. That he, he's calling you for something specific. I don't know what that is, but God has a purpose for your life. And, and listen, I was, I was like, I was a kid, you know, and and of course, come to find out that that was the moment, that was the moment that God began to speak into my heart that I was going to go into ministry, that, that I did have a unique calling, that I had been called into ministry. And ever since really that time, I have somehow known that I was to do what I am doing. And, and because most of you don't know me really that well, or you don't know my history, what you don't uh, realize that at that point, if, if God were to name me what I was instead of what I was going to do, he would have named me a fearful shy child. Uh, because what, what you don't know is that a lot of times in school and in middle school and even early high school, I had a mental game that I would play because I would get so uh, anxious and nervous around people and I didn't like to be uh, pointed out in a crowd. I never wanted to be having any attention on me. Uh, I would pretend that I was living in my own tent. No kidding. It's a thing in my family. Like, Dustin, just go back to your tent. Some of you are probably psychoanalyzing that right now. It's like, hmm, definitely a little disturbing. Something's going on. But hey, listen, listen. Because God didn't name me what I was, but he started to speak to me what I could do and what he could do in and through me is that God took a shy, terrified, scared child where I speak in front of people every single week. Some of y'all would rather jump out of an airplane than do what I do. And it isn't because I'm super brave or super awesome or any of those things. It's because I was able to walk in the purpose of which God had spoken to me and I was faithful to it. And so I want to tell you, God does the same thing to you. He wants to speak over you. Some of you, man, you need to be adoptive parents. Some of you need to be far more generous than you're being. Some of you need to move jobs or you need to stay put. Some of you need to share your faith on a much regular basis. Some of you need to step out and be mentors. I don't know what God's calling you to do, but I know that when he calls you to it, it will be something you can't do right now. He's not going to try to just do it right here. He's going to try to move you along and enter into a process and a season of preparation. And so let God speak his future over you. You may be called to be a leader, a provider, a friend to those who are difficult to be friends with, a protector, forgiver, a healer, teacher, etc. I don't know. And listen, I can't can't always tell you either. I do know that if you want to know, because that's that's something to be asked, how do I know? I didn't know that was the night that was going to change my life. And I've held on to that thing for 20-something years. But I do know That if you're not putting yourself in situations, either in prayer or around other Christian believers who can confirm what God's calling in your life, you probably won't know. I mean, maybe sometimes God will run you off the road, you know, he'll have an overpowering moment, but most of the time it happens in small things, small confirmations, small conversations, believer to believer, in times of prayer where God begins to birth a passion and desire for you that you would not have put there yourself. So... I do want to say, important distinction, only God has the authority to tell you what your purpose is. Because where a lot of us might be afraid of what God may call us to do, there's another section of us that actually just want to invite God along into our plan. Okay, This isn't in the story, but I just need to speak to this. It does not work in a way that where we get to choose our destination, where we get to choose our purpose, and then we get to look back and say, hey God, you keeping up? You know, come bless me over here. And because that's actually what builds a lot of resentment within Christians is that we step out, we move, we change, we do this, we do that. We start dating them. We go to this job. We spend money here. And then in the process of, we think, oh, I better stop and pray and talk to God about this. Lord, 
I just put a down payment on this house that I can't afford. I need you to open the doors of heaven because you got a thousand cattle on the hill, Lord. I, you know I can't afford this house. I need you to come through. What did you pray about affording that house? Because I want to tell you something. If God told you and you know that that's what you're supposed to have, I believe you can act in faith. But if you're like on the backside of it going like, Lord, I need you to come through for me now. And God's like, well, why am I going to help you when I wasn't even a part of it? Like, like <laughs> we're about to go into a season where there's a man that we don't think about but once a year and we go sit on his lap and kids ask him what he wants for Christmas. That's not who God is. He is no Santa Claus. And so it isn't that we come just when we need him, right? So, so just, that's not in this Gideon story. Gideon's response was actually fear and frustration. That's not, but I, that's just worth being so. So, so to prepare what God has for you in this next season, let God speak to your future. The second thing you need to be aware of is that when God does speak to you, the natural course of action generally is, and it's from our own mind, is beware of excuses. Beware of excuses. What is Judges, Judges, Judges 6, 15? He said to him, please, Lord, how can I deliver Israel? How can I fix this problem? Look, my family is the weakest in Manasseh. We don't got no friends. We ain't got no connections. We don't have any money. I can't call any favors. There's nothing that my family can do. And I am the youngest in my family. You've come to the wrong person, which is interesting because God has a pattern of going to the least likely of those, doesn't he? We got that all over the place, don't we? Moses couldn't speak. Yet God calls him to be a leader and a judge of the whole nation of Israel. Abraham and Sarah couldn't have kids. God didn't pick a young family, he picks an old one. You know, God goes and finds David, a young shepherd boy that's never seen battle to defeat a giant. You know? And so all throughout Scripture, God loves to use the weak to shame the strong, the, the unwise to bring shame to what the world sees as wise. And so the thing is, is what happens for a lot of us, and some of you might be sitting in this exact tension right now, and I want to tell you, God sees you, and he hears you, and he knows your pain. But some of you feel called to something, and you are scared because of the change that it'll bring, terrified that you won't have the talent or the stamina or the skill skill to live up to it. You're afraid of what others will say about you because you're known for something else. You're known for being this. And if you quit this, left this, started this, whatever it is, you are afraid of what other people are going to think of you. And so what you're doing right now is in your season of preparation, you are giving excuses and you need to be aware of excuses. And we can't blame all the excuses on the devil. Now he'll try to lie to you in the middle of it too, but most of the excuses come from my own heart, come from your own heart. Lord, I can't do that. I can't, I'm not as good as them, you know? That's, that's why social media sometimes is dangerous. I, I, I experienced, listen, I experienced this even in the church world. Just to show you how this, I'll say, man, Lord, I need to speak on this. And I feel it in my heart. And then I'll hear another pastor preach it. And I'm like, I can't preach it that good. We might as well just show that sermon. I can't, I can't preach it that good. I can't talk about it. I'm not as talented as that guy. I mean, he's, he's speaking to hundreds of thousands. I can't compete with that. But you know what? God ain't called that man here, right? God ain't called that man here. God, ain't, God hadn't put that person that you're comparing yourself to in your spot, in your work, in your life. Stop with excuses. And I know it's scary. I know it may require financial sacrifice. It might require selling some things that you probably don't need anyway. You're right. Maybe this isn't what you had in mind five years ago. But remember, God has a plan for you. He wants you to succeed in that plan, and your best life will be found in that plan. So don't make excuses. See, God chooses. He chooses us. He chooses to work through us, but he allows us, us to choose what we do. God gives us the, the freedom to choose, and that's a, that's a powerful thing that we don't need to take for granted. And I just, we just need to know that because so often, I know in my own heart, I want to blame God when I'm the one that believed the excuse. I want to blame God, but I'm the one who didn't step out in faith. See, God answers Josh, uh, uh, Gideon. I keep saying Joshua. God answers Gideon. Verse 16 says, Gideon, but I will be with you. And that's always the answer. That when you're afraid, that when you are fearful, God doesn't send you, he walks with you. God will not call you to something that he will not accompany you to. 
The problem is we're used to walking alone so much, we convince ourselves that God won't walk with us. And that is not what he does. He doesn't send us out like servants. He walks with us like a friend. He says, Gideon, this is possible not because of your talent, because you're right, boy. You ain't got it. You're right, son. You are here hiding. But I pick those who hide. And through my power and my will, when they partner with me, that army becomes like it's one man. So don't allow excuses to get in the way because God is with you. God with you means that you can go further, faster than you could ever go at alone. God with you means that you can go further, faster than you can ever go alone. I'm going to finish this up here. This third one is really, really key. And we're going to have to read the end of this story here. But the third one is this. To stay faithful in a season of preparation, we must maintain a humble heart. We must maintain a humble heart. Now, the reason I put that here and maybe go back to my table illustration here, uh, a lot of times what happens is the preparation season can be really hard in anything in life, whether it's putting together a dinner, putting together a table, following God's call in your life, doing something difficult like that. And in the middle of it, we're often very aware of the of the help that we need from others, the, the help that, that God provides us. But then we kind of get onto the other side of that valley, other side of that mountain climb, and now we're reaping the rewards. We're being successful in our calling. God is moving in our life. Things are happening. People are loving our dinner, whatever the analogy is. And all of a sudden, we get to be thinking, you're right, I did do a good job, didn't I? I'm pretty doggone smart. I'm a good cook. I can sure make a good table. I can sure do all this stuff. I sure can speak good. I sure can love good. I can sure do all of these things, right? And so what happens is, is after the preparation, after God gets us into this new place, man, our old heart, that's why we always need to be aware of what's on our table. We don't need to let sin get into our minds and our life because we'll begin to think that it was us that got us there. I did all the work. I did all that hard work. It was my sleepless nights that got me here. Sure, God had some to do with it, but really it was me. So what Gideon does is extremely powerful. So later in the story, what happens is, for a little context, uh, Gideon at this point that we've read, he hasn't fully been aware of who this stranger is. I, I'm sure he, he knows that it's somebody. He's probably thinking it's a prophet or someone of that nature. So what he does to kind of make sure this person is legit is he, he's, he runs off and he actually goes and gets a meal and he, and he cooks it on some hot stones. He's like, listen, hang here. He actually tells the angel of the Lord, tells the Lord, wait here while I go get some stuff. And it's like, okay. So I just find it bizarre that the Lord just waits. Like, I just want you to know, the Lord will just wait on you, you know? You know, he's, he's patient. He's got all the time in the world. You know, it's your life that's wasting away. But uh, so the Lord waits on Gideon. And Gideon comes back. He makes this meal. And it says, when the angel of the Lord touched it, everything was consumed by fire. And at that point, Gideon finally knew in whose presence he was, and he freaks out. He is actually convinced that now he's going to die. So this is in verse 22. This is what he says. When Gideon realized that he was the angel of the Lord, he says, Oh, no, Lord God, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And he is panicked and he's freaked. But then the Lord answered and he says, But the Lord said to him, Peace to you. Don't be afraid for you will not die. So chill out, chill out, bro. So 24, so this is the key. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, the Lord is peace. And it is still there in Ophrah today. So what Gideon did is he, he memorialized this moment when his life was altered by the call of God. Now, we don't build altars today. I don't expect you to go. I don't return to that church. But in my heart and mind, I have set an altar of remembrance. And I'll tell you how this works for me. This is, this is very true. Being transparent here. There are times in my calling of ministry where I can get extremely frustrated. I can get extremely disappointed and discouraged. I can feel like the best thing for me and my family is to jump ship to do something else. People are difficult. The world is hard. COVID has completely changed so much about church and life. This isn't how I saw things happening in my own head. So many things. I can, I can come up with a hundred things. And so whenever I get to a point like that, what I do is I, what the Lord does 
is he brings to mind these moments of confirmation in and over my life. And whether it was that moment back then or moments when I know for a hand he rescued me from death. Like if God wanted me dead, I'd be dead. Just be frank. You know, I just wouldn't be here. And so I I go back to these little altars where I can say, Lord, you were faithful then. Why would you not be faithful now? Lord, you called me then. I know you're still calling me now. I know that I, I still have a purpose. I know that you have not forgotten me. And so I want to ask you, where are your altars? Because Gideon made an altar so that he could go back to that place. And, and even in recording this later, Gideon's long dead when this is being recorded. They're saying, that thing still stands. When God came through again for his people, he came through again through a weak person. He came through again from a person that didn't think they were worthy, didn't think they had what it took. And there stands that reminder to this day that God is faithful. And he calls those who don't think they have the capacity. So where are your altars? Where are your little reminders? And maybe that's, you need to start journaling. Maybe that's, you need to start regularly having a time with the Lord where he can build that in you. Certainly, if you're not spending any time with God in your life, like, that is a big issue. How are you going to be reminded? How are you going to know you're on the right path? You're just doing this alone, man. Just out there threshing wheat, hiding in a wine press. So we set little reminders So that our hearts remain humble. That our hearts don't run away with itself and say, look what I did. Or where's God at? Or he's forgotten me. Serves the same purpose. We stay stay humble. We stay hungry after God. Because listen, listen. God has a plan for you. Listen to me. God wants you to succeed in that plan. And please know, your best life will be lived in that plan. So I want to ask you, are you happy with where you are? Are you, are you thinking like, is this really what you're supposed to be doing? I mean, I know this is a big, hard question. But is this it? Is this all there is for you? I, I dare to imagine that there's something more for you. I dare to imagine that this is not the point that God has something more, that he has something, he has something special. He has something unique that you need to fulfill because there are people that are coming to the table of your life, your spiritual table. And man, we live in a world that's hungry and that's thirsty, that's homeless and starving, that are, that's lost and confused, and they're seeking every which way, and they're reading every which thing. And listen, we as the people of God, we have the living God living in us, in you. You are a temple of the Most High God. You know what a temple is? A place where people go to find out what God wants them to do. That means you are one of those things. You are a table of the Lord. You are offering out into the world around you this, this meal. But what meal is it? Is it the fruit of the Spirit of God? Or is it something different? Maybe the fruit of selfishness or bitterness or frustration or anger, self-intention, self-direction. So I want to encourage you, don't rush your preparation season. Maybe you feel like you're wasting time, that God's forgotten you. None of those things are true. Maybe you're hiding away like Gideon. Maybe you're running off in your own way, trying to direct your own life. But man, I want to tell you that God has a plan for you. And when you live in that plan, when you start accomplishing that plan, man, come hell or high water, there's nothing like knowing that God is on your side. There's nothing like walking in his wake and knowing that he goes before and being confident and praying with confidence that God, I know you hear me. God, I know you're with me. God, I know you're leading me. I know you've brought me here. You don't leave me in the forests. You don't leave me in the desert. You don't leave your people there. You always move on behalf of, but can you pray with that kind of confidence? It's there, but it's when we're living in his plan. I want to pray and close for us. Thank you guys so much for being here. Don't forget to sign your kids up if you have any, 5 to 18 for the kids' choir. And I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this moment. 
the story, how we can be reminded that you have a purpose for us, that you have a unique plan, a unique agenda to work in and through our life to impact change in this world for your kingdom. So I pray that we are faithful, that we seek it out, that we don't live purposeful, selfish, fearful lives. God, I pray desperately for clarity for those who don't even know what that is. And I pray for courage for those who do but are afraid to move. Or may your spirit and saturate our hearts so that when people come to our table, we don't serve them the fruit of the flesh, but we serve them the fruit of your spirit. And that they know that something is different because you live in us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Hope you guys have a wonderful week. See you later.